Thank you very much, Dietmar. Thank you very much to the organizers for inviting me. I'm very honored to be here at the opening of the Einstein Center. Uh, those of you who are following the program will see that my title's changed. Uh, I'm sorry about that, but uh, when I was first invited, I extrapolated from my previous very happy experiences in Berlin, interacting with uh, the Berlin School for Mind and Brain, where there's normally been quite a lot of philosophers and quite a lot of neuroscientists, cognitive scientists, and we've kind of done stuff in the middle. So I thought, well, I'll talk about, I was going to talk about the skillful mind, which was what sports science has shown us about how athletes cope in very fast reaction sports like tennis or baseball or cricket and what that shows us about the interaction between conscious deliberation and automatic uh, uh, abilities, uh, but which I've been working on quite a lot recently. In fact, I've written a book that's coming out, knowing the score about sport in a few months. But when I saw the program, I realized I was the only philosopher on the program. And so, somewhat paradoxically, I thought it'd be better to talk about a purely philosophical topic. So that's what I'm going to do. So now the physical mind, not the skillful mind. So, and what I'm going to talk about is the explanatory gap. I think Dietmar mentioned it in passing last night. Uh, uh, when you've got all the neuroscience, can you really understand? You have Fustian of the... The conscious, the conscious processes. And so this is also something I've written a lot about, and so I can, I can talk about that happily. What you've got here is the, the conclusion. This is a summary of where we're going, and then I'm going to fill it out. So the explanatory gap is supposed to be some kind of deep problem. It's sometimes very much the same thing called the hard problem, which is supposed to be some problem that's left after we've done all the scientific work on consciousness. Uh, we, we've done all the neuroscience we can possibly do, but still then we're left with this puzzle. I think that's a mistake. I don't think there's any puzzle left after we've done all the science. I think that people only think there's a puzzle because they can't stop thinking in dualist terms. That's, that's Rene Descartes. Uh, uh, prime dualist, and I think that at an intuitive level, we're stuck with thinking like Rene Descartes, and that's why we think there's some puzzle left unsolved by science. And I think that if we could kind of rid ourselves of this dualist thinking, then everything would be just fine. So I don't think the, the hard problem, the expansionary gap, is some, some business left unfinished by normal science. It's a problem generated by the fact that we find it hard to be scientific enough. Okay, so that's my, that's my uh, overall uh, uh, message from this talk. Let's go more slowly. Oh, wrong way. It's the reversed. So, suppose we, suppose we got to this uh, uh, ideal future state where we know the neural correlates of all mental, mental states. And I'm interested specifically in conscious states. If I say mental states, understand me as meaning some conscious conscious mental state. I'm not interested in, in uh, early vision or anything like that. It's, it's, it's the kind of mental states that go with an awareness, a feeling, or what it's like we, we have some conscious experience. And so suppose for every such mental conscious type, we've identified some, some physical, physiological P, some, some uh, neural process that occurs if and only if P. So for, let's imagine that we figured out what it is to have read experience in neural terms. There's some kind of neural activity in V4. I know that V4 is just a name for something we don't know quite where it is in humans. Uh, uh, we're supposed to know where it is in monkeys, but people are figuring out where it is in humans. Uh, it's kind of interesting that when philosophers look for an example of a worked out neural correlate of consciousness, it's rather hard to find a good one. This is the best we can do, and it's still something that's very much uh, pie in the future sky. But that's not, that's not my, my topic today. So we found that there's some, something we can identify in everyday terms, read experiences, and it's present all and only when we have a certain kind of neural activity. Now, compare that with other scientific cases where we start off with some everyday kind, I don't know, water, salt, heat, and then we find some microphysical 
uh, correlates, some microphysical process or, or state that's always there when we have the everyday kind. So we find whenever we've got water, we've got H2O. When we, whenever we've got heat, we've got molecular motion. Whenever we've got salt, we've got sodium chloride. And then we conclude, well, well, heat just is molecular motion. Water just is H2O. Salt just is sodium chloride. They're the same thing. So by analogy, we ought to conclude that seeing red just is that neural activity in V4. And that's indeed what I think we ought to do. I mean, this will come out in the course of my, course of my talk. But this is where the explanatory gap is supposed to arise. That's, that's Joe, Joe Levine, a, a good friend of mine. He's a uh, professor at uh, University of Massachusetts in Amherst. Uh, and 30 years ago or so, he pointed out that the mind-brain cases strike us quite differently from the other scientific cases. Even after we're shown all the evidence, there's a perfect correlation, and we're told, well, look, so red experience is, is, is the same as that activity in V4. We, we remain puzzled. We say, hang on, why does that neural activity go with red? Why doesn't it go with green? I mean, there's nothing, nothing to stop. Why didn't we, weren't things arranged like that? Why does it go with anything at all? Why, why, why is there consciousness at all? Why aren't we just, why aren't we just zombies? These are very natural questions to continue asking even after we've shown the perfect correlation. And it contrasts very strikingly with how it is in the sciences. We don't go on after we're shown salt is made of sodium chloride. Why? Why are those molecules salt? We don't ask why is H2O water. I mean, they're just the same thing. There's nothing, nothing to be puzzled about here. So that's the explanatory gap. Let me try and be more specific about what's terminology here. Some philosophers, as we'll see, think that the explanatory gap testifies to a real ontological gap in nature. They think there's two things. There's the, the brain processes and in addition, separate dualist Descartes, there's consciousness. Other philosophers uh, don't go with that. They think it's just a kind of gap in understanding. Rarely they're the same thing, but we can't quite understand. It's, a, it's an explanatory gap, some kind of epistemological difficulty. As I'm going to try and persuade you, both those lots are wrong. There isn't really a big issue here at all. But still, I don't want to deny what Joe Levine points to, that at a psychological, sociological level, the two kinds of identities do strike us as different. It's very natural for human beings to go on asking why in the mind-brain case when they have no such inclination in the chemical case, in the heat and molecular motion case. So when I say the explanatory gap, I just mean that kind of psychological observation about human beings. They, they react to the mind-brain case differently. So the question is, what should we make of this initially psychological fact? What's behind the fact that humans don't feel as happy with the mind-brain identities as they do with the other scientific ones. Well, some philosophers, that's Frank Jackson on who's left. On, on their right, it's Frank Jackson, and on their left, it's David Chalmers. And they're two philosophers who started with the explanatory gap and had some we won't go into it, and they're not very good, uh, 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 extra lemmas, and they conclude dualism. The mind and brain are just, just separate. Uh, it's, uh, it's like Descartes said. There's, uh, there's the, the physical brain, and then in addition, perhaps not quite inside space, but in some separate realm, there's all the feelings and uh, 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 sense of self and decisions and so on. And many people are attracted to this view because... They think, oh, well, that's much better. I mean, we didn't want to be just machines. It's much better if we have this separate realm where there's feelings and decisions and autonomy and, and that will restore free will and uh, self-identity and so on. But in fact, it doesn't work out so easily because one thing, nearly everybody in this debate agrees in philosophy as well as science, is that... The physical world is causally closed. So everybody agrees that if you're studying the brain 
and you want to understand why something happens, you can always explain it in terms of prior physical or physiological processes. You don't have to go outside the physical realm to understand why certain neurons fired in my motor, motor cortex. Nobody now thinks that the, the independent uh, Cartesian mind comes down and wiggles things in the brain. That's what Descartes thought. He thought it wiggled things in the pineal gland. But that's now been discredited. Everybody, uh, and it's an interesting qu question why, because I think 150 years ago they didn't think that, but now everybody thinks, I think because of advances in neuroscience, advances in, in uh, cellular physiology has persuaded everybody that we don't need anything to explain what goes on in the brain except electrical and chemical, chemical forces, the fundamental forces of physics. So that implies that the, you know, the brain can take care of itself and if there is a separate mind, it's got to be epiphenomenal. That's the, the reason I've got the train, the puffs of smoke. The puffs of smoke are what you have to think about the mind once you recognize the force of the physical thought that everything in the brain is physically caused. If there are separate uh, mental events, then they're going to have no influence on what goes on in the brain. And that's not so good for, for free will and autonomy and consciousness, uh, self-identity at all. Uh, in fact, it's pretty, I mean, the, the epiphenomenalist view is a really very unhappy view indeed. When... Chalmers and Jackson first developed their arguments, concluded that, that we have to be dualists. They accepted. They accepted because of this uh, uh, recognition of the authority of, of science that therefore they're going to have to be epiphenomenalists. But the more they thought about it, the more they thought it really wasn't a very satisfactory view. What I think persuaded them was this thought. So if epiphenomenalism is true, there's all the brain that goes on, and then there's this extra stuff, uh, kind of like the puffs of smoke. But so, in principle, you could imagine a being who's just like, uh, just like you, uh, but doesn't have the extra stuff. I mean, in, in the philosophical terms, that's a zombie, uh, a being who's got all the physical processes but no extra stuff. And if you're somebody like Chalmers and Jackson, who's persuaded of dualism, well, then your zombie counterpart will also be persuaded of dualism, will write all the same books, say all the same things, because all that is determined by their physical nature. So, you'd believe all this stuff about dualism, even if dualism weren't true. The truth of dualism that they're assuming is not having any influence on their philosophical views. And, and I think that's what eventually persuaded them to give up, give up the dualism, and they've both become a species of, of physicalist. They accept that, in reality, the, the conscious processes and the physical brain states are one and the same thing. Still, a lot of philosophers who accept that still think there's a big puzzle here. There's some kind of mystery. There's something we don't understand. So the view is that, in reality, the conscious processes and the brain processes are one and the same thing. But nevertheless, we can't really understand why they're the same thing. I mean, it's an interesting question here, whether it's a failure of Festeian or a failure of Eclara. And after, after Dietmar started talking about Festeian last night, I thought, well, it's really a matter of Festeian, it's understanding. But then I looked at the German translation, and it's Eclaren Luca, isn't it? The explanatory gap. Eclaren. Anyway, uh, let's not worry about Festeian and Eclaren. Uh, uh, there's something puzzling, and these people think this puzzle is... Uh, due to our having some lack of information, lack of theory, and there's various views. So that's on the top left, Tom Nagel, there's Daniel Stoljar, on the bottom is Galen Strawson, and then on the bottom, bottom right for us is Colin McGinn. And they all think in various ways that, that if only we had better theories, better uh, knowledge of what's going on, somehow we're lacking, then we'd understand uh, why the mind and the brain are the same thing. We'd understand how the brain uh, gives rise to the mind, how it generates, generates the feelings. They're listed there in kind of order of increasing pessimism. So 
Nagel and Stoljar think that maybe future science will, will give us a new kind of understanding of the brain processes, which will make it clear why, why the processes give rise to feelings. Uh, Strawson and McGinn rather think that that's not going to happen. Strawson for uh, reasons to do with the nature of the mind. McGinn, he thinks we're kind of too stupid. Uh, he thinks that we stand to the problem of consciousness like lobsters stand to general relativity. There's no kind of uh, principal difficulty here. We're just not, we're just not uh, smart enough. Paul McGinn, apart from his... Uh, he's, he's got this general theory in philosophy that all the long-standing problems, free will, uh, uh, I don't know, what it, moral objectivity, consciousness, uh, are all long-standing problems in philosophy because we are too stupid to figure out the answers, which is uh, a sad position for a philosopher to argue themselves into because it's not clear what you say next after you've said that. But, uh, uh, okay, my own view is that these people are all barking up the wrong, the wrong tree. There's nothing hard to understand about physicalism. I mean, my view is that there's the experience of seeing something red, there's certain activity in V4, and they're just the same thing, like salt and uh, sodium chloride. Uh, what's so hard to understand? I mean, why does it feel like that? Well, what would you expect it to feel like, to have a brain with a V4 area that's got a certain neural activity. Well, I mean, it's got to feel like something. It might feel like, well, why would you expect this? That's what it feels like. It turns out that's what it's feel like. What's to, what's to be puzzled about? The reason people find themselves puzzled is they don't really accept the identity. Even after we're shown all the evidence and we accept that they're fully correlated, we go on thinking of the conscious feelings as something, as something extra, some further part of reality that's additional to, additional to the brain. And of course, when you think like that, well, then you'll want some more explanation. Once you've got two things, you'll think, as, as I said at the beginning, why does this brain process give rise to this extra thing, the red feeling, rather than some other extra thing, or no extra thing at all? You're kind of positing all these extra connections between different parts of reality, and now you're puzzled about why those connections are there. But if you could only accept that there's just one thing, then you wouldn't go on asking, why is it itself? That's not the kind of question we ask. Here's, here's a, an analogy that, that I've sometimes... Suppose that there's two groups of historians, and one studies the... The, the author Mark Twain, and the other studies the, the uh, Mississippi boat pilot and uh, uh, entrepreneur Samuel Clements, and they're at a conference together, and late one night in the bar they start looking at each other's uh, 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 papers, and they, th they find, goodness me, they say, this, this person's always in the same place, Twain and Clements, they're always in the same place, and after a while they think, it's the same person, goodness me. And so, at that point, what, what, they might wonder, why did this person have two names? Why did it take us so long to figure out they're the same person? They won't ask, why is Mark Twain Samuel Clements? You don't ask, once you've accepted an identity, why the identity should be so. It's got to be so. There's just one thing there. One thing can't be two things. So my view is, if only we could fully accept the mind-brain identities, we'd stop asking these questions. Some of you might be surprised to be told that you're only puzzled. I mean, I'm sure some of you are puzzled because you're implicit dualist, you're closet dualist. You haven't realized that you're thinking in dualist terms. But, I mean, there's quite a lot I could say about, about this, but here's a, here's a simple demonstration. Think about the phrases that I, I slipped myself into a, a while ago. Certain brain processes give rise to consciousness. Why do these brain processes yield consciousness? Why do they generate the feelings? Why do they generate this feeling rather than that feeling? As soon as you put the question in those terms, you're already thinking in dualist terms. You've already slipped into the wrong way of thinking that's generating the spurious explanatory gap. Uh, 
Think, I mean, think of fire and smoke. I mean, fire, fire gives rise to smoke, it generates smoke, it yields smoke, but that's because there's two separate things, the cause and the, the effect. But we don't talk about H2O as generating water or yielding water or giving rise to water, it just is water. So the terms we use to talk about the mind-brain relation are already showing that we've been seduced into a spurious dualism that make, making us ask these, these bad questions. Okay, I'm nearly, nearly done. I don't think that this implicit, naive dualism that has us in such a strong grip is a big problem for physicalism. I should think we should just accept that, that we find it very hard to believe the mind-brain identities and live with it and think that, in theory, we understand they're the same, even though intuitively find it very hard to accept. There's plenty of other cases where we find it hard to accept things we theoretically know to be true. I mean, there's the Muller-Lyer lines, right? So you've all seen them. You all know those two lines are the same length, but it strikes you that they're different lengths. You just live with that. Not a perfect analogy because that's a, a visual illusion contrasting with your, your cognitive, your, your belief that they're the same length. But there's other cases where within the realm of belief and theory we have, have contradictory ideas. I mean, we all now accept that the Earth is moving, but intuitively it's not, not moving. We know space is non-Euclidean. Intuitively, it strikes us Euclidean. I think that a description of reality that just says where everything happened at what time, a big kind of spatio-temporal map, doesn't leave anything out. That's my theory. But intuitively, I can't help feeling that in addition, there's a little red dot that kind of moves along, and I'm on the back of, and it's taking us all through time. But I think that's an intuitive mistake. Uh, I'm actually an Everettian in quantum mechanics. So I think the universe splits every, uh, lots of times every second. I mean, more than that. Uh, here's, a, here's a simple psychological case. My, I think that theoretically, I know that my status is lower than I think it is. This is, this is illusory uh, superiority. Everybody, uh, the psychological tests show, rank themselves higher than the rest of people rank them. And I know that. So I know that, I mean, theoretically, intuitively, I still think I'm up there. And I mean, that's how, so I think that's how it is in the mind-brain case. We know in reality they're the same thing, but intuitively, we find that very hard to accept. So we should just recognize that our thinking is split. At an intuitive level, we can't believe the identities. We carry on asking, why does the brain give rise to these extra feelings? But at a theoretical level, we should realize that those questions are premised on a mistake. The red experience just is the V4 activity. No need to explain why that thing is in itself. OK, so there's a question unanswered by what I've been saying, which is, why is it that we're in the grip of this intuitive dualism. Why do we find it so hard to accept the mind-brain identities when in other realms we can uh, accept them quite happily? And I haven't said anything about that. Uh, I have lots of theories about that. I've, writ I've written about it. But that hasn't been the topic today. All I wanted to persuade you today is not, I'm, I'm, I haven't been trying to ask the question, why are we intuitive dualists? I wanted just to show you that we're intuitive dualists and that that's the only source of the so-called explanatory gap. So I'll stop there. Thanks.